good evening to all our online participants and members a very warm welcome to this virtual meeting on the latest developments at the oecd including tax challenges of the digital economy i on behalf of all of us and also i also welcome dr david danbury from oecd who has joined us joined us from paris good afternoon to you david and i also extend a very sincere thank you to agreeing to be with us today i acknowledge the presence of mr tp oswal who will be playing the anchor for today the chairman of the international tax committee and past president of the society dr mayur nayak and our young conveners ritwik rajesh shah and siddarth who will be playing host for today's meeting for the benefit of the speaker and many first timers who will be attending today i would like to introduce the society to you the bombay chartered accountant society or bcas as it is popularly called is a not for public pub, not for profit public charitable trust formed in the year 1949 we are a leading oldest and the leading and the largest voluntary organization of chartered accountants we are a principle centric learning oriented organization promoting knowledge to our members and public at large currently we serve about 9000 members and we have 38000 social media followers and over the past 7 decades we have been disseminating knowledge to our members and community at large and our unique selling point has always been our event be it lecture meeting seminars workshop residential courses or long duration courses and our publications i am happy to inform you that during the past two months or so we have clocked almost 100000 man hours of viewership both including live viewership and follow up youtube hits i would request all of us all of you to follow us on our social media handle bcas global on twitter facebook linkedin and youtube now coming to the topic and speaker for today in the words of oecd the world economy and societies are going through a digital transformation that goes well beyond computerization and the use of information and telecommunication technologies this transformation is creating opportunities and challenges for all levels of government in the areas of tax and expenditure policies and administration service deliveries and financial or fiscal management and regulatory and uh, practices and policies friends we all know that the whole world has gone digital the digital economy today is not only restricted to the b2b or b2c transactions over the internet or by email or just online shopping shopping there is much more to it the entire gamut of e-commerce music film entertainment industry intellectual property right online education training sports sponsorship and much more is all part of the digital space companies are now able to do business in geographies without having a physical presence there countries and jurisdictions like india are consuming goods and services whereas other countries are providing for goods and services where to book these accounting profits from such transactions which who will tax these profits and in place where the consumption takes place or where the supply takes place it is easier for such jurisdiction each jurisdiction to frame policies and laws that favor their own situation but the role of oecd is vital oecd needs to balance and come out with a model tax convention that serves as a template for allocating taxation rights between countries in a just and equitable way oecd currently has its hands full what are the challenges before the oecd what are the recent developments at the oecd what are the status of the ongoing projects the beps mli and other projects, other similar projects what projects are currently in pipeline what to expect in future and what is the thinking and the frame of mind to address all these things and much more on the digital taxation we have mr david bradbury with us and i once again welcome you and thanking you for spending your afternoon and our evening in india for us and with these words again i welcome you and thanks a lot and i would request uh, dr mayun nayak to take the proceedings from here thank you mayun bhai the floor is all yours yeah uh, thank you very much uh, uh, manish uh, uh, welcome friends uh, welcome to our learned speaker levit dredbury uh, chairman for the session mr p oswal uh, conveners uh, ruthvik rajesh pisha and siddarth 
friends i have a immense uh, pleasure uh, you know to introduce our speaker for the evening mr david bradbury who is head of the tax policy and statistics division center for tax policy and administration at the oecd friends david is an australian national and joined the oecd in april 2014 where he now leads a team of economists lawyers and statisticians who are focused on delivering high quality economic analysis and tax policy advice and providing internationally comparable tax data and statistical analysis as a member of the management team at the center for the tax policy and administration david was a key contributor to the delivery of the oecd g20 base erosion and profit shifting uh, bafs projects and its implementation He has also led the OECD's involvement with the task force on the digital economy and led the team responsible for delivering the interim report on the tax challenges arising from digitalization of to G20 uh, finance ministers. Prior to joining the OECD, David was a lawyer, a member of the House of Representatives in the Australian Parliament, and a minister in the Australian government. He served in the Australian government as the assistant treasurer. Minister for Competition Policy and Consumer Affairs, Minister Assisting for Financial Services and Superannuation, and Minister Assisting for Deregulation. As a minister, David led the Australian contribution to the debate on BAPS and implemented key taxation reforms, including landmark amendments to the Central to the GAR Part 4A and the modernisation of Australia's transfer pricing laws. David has completed an undergraduate degree in arts, majoring in government uh, and public administration, and honors degree in law, and has completed postgraduate studies in taxation law at the University of Sydney. We find uh, Mr. David is a multifaceted personality, and he is going to enlighten us today on a very important subject of uh, the recent developments at OECD as. Uh, President Manish uh, Sampat uh, talked about the role of the OECD in international taxation. We all know uh, how important uh, role OECD is playing, and I am glad to uh, you know inform you that BCA has a long-standing relationship with the OECD. Uh, in June 2011, a special transfer pricing conference was organized by OECD at its premises for the visiting delegation of the Bombay Chartered Accountant Society, OECD Paris. BCS has reprinted under special arrangement OECD commentary on model conventions in 2010 in 2017 similarly BCS also reprinted uh, 2010 and 2017 transfer pricing guidelines under again a special arrangement with OECD and recently OECD granted special permission to BCS to publish its literature in the compendium of on MRI which is right now under printing friends uh, we have with us uh, sir tp ostwal uh, ex chairman of the ifa india branch so a trustee of the foundation for international taxation uh, he is a leading tax expert uh, and uh, representing india in uh, various committees in un and is a visiting faculty at vienna university he is going to chair this meeting and uh, this uh, few words may i request uh, mr ostwal to Take over, and I once again thank Mr. David uh, Redbury for readily agreeing to address our members. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayur. Thank you, Rajesh, for uh, uh, both of you for giving me an opportunity to be with you to chair the session, and uh, uh, thanks to David uh, Bradbury for uh, making this uh, event successful. You are presenting this uh, paper, which is very very relevant to a country like ours. and we are one of the country which follow your regulations which you create though you don't finalize but indian government immediately implement it we are known for implementing much faster than anybody else now there is no consensus on global uh, there is no concession consensus on uh, the taxation of digital activities internationally so therefore whatever suggestions you gave in your draft documents in the action one people have adopted their own measures and started implementing it 
and you can see equalization levy was one of the first country to get introduced was india and then we have extended the arms of equalization levy in other part of other activities like e commerce activities we have seen that there are number of other countries which have come out with this uh, type of taxation that is you can see italy uk france uh, turkey nigeria spain austria czech republic indonesia and host of other countries which have introduced taxes on digital transactions and such consider such countries consider it to be uh, unfairly target uh, but such countries are considered to be unfairly targeting such activities by one of the countries because they believe that uh, the other country should not unilaterally adopt these measures it must be globally adopted solution i think the solution does not seems to get quickly in the near future likely to happen and therefore uh, this uh, unilateral measures are going to continue but at the same time if you look at the covid 19 situation uh, and the streets are all vacant shops are all closed and therefore all the transactions happening are all on the digital platform including me who have never bothered to really take care of the digital transactions on the uh, on the digital platform we have no other choice than to do that by by sitting at home no other work therefore you do the transactions and become little expert and getting confidence in how to do the digital transactions we believed in ch issuing checks but now the check has become out of fashion uh, situation oecd's project which began in 2017 on digital taxation uh, does not seems to be getting completed in this year hopefully if they come out with a draft document by october and they may finalize uh, in december and therefore we will see the light of the day of that particular project but i don't know really whether everybody agrees to that project uh, but looking at the covid situation the countries will have to compromise the countries are now not concerned with the taxes but they are concerned with the life of the public and therefore they may give this as a, a less attentive measures and but if you look at the oecd's drive they came out with number of guidance to the various countries in the world the impact of covid 19 pandemic and emerging response to the crisis fiscal packages all are guided by oecd and including the country like ours which has followed them with this small introduction i don't want to take uh, um, this my introductory uh, part of the speech a little longer so i leave it to mr david bradbury and we are here eager to he hear mr bradbury on the subject thank you mr bradbury please you can proceed with the matter well thanks very much tp and thank you also uh, to mayor and manish for the uh, warm welcome and the introduction i'm just trying to uh, share my presentation hopefully that's coming through onto the screen now yes yes it is coming sir fantastic uh, well look uh, we we like to start uh, our uh, introductions on uh, these new virtual platforms by saying good morning good afternoon good evening uh, to cater for the fact that uh, so many of you will be joining from various time zones but i think good evening is perhaps the the starting point given uh, that i expect uh, that's exactly what time of day it is for for many of you uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to present today on behalf of the oecd and Uh, indeed the OECD has had a very very uh, rich and strong relationship with the Bombay Chartered Accountants Society for a number of years and uh, it's in the context of that ongoing relationship that I have the privilege of making a presentation today now the presentation uh, which is built under the heading of latest developments at the OECD covid-19 and beyond uh, really begins with um, and and focuses very much on what are the implications of the current pandemic and the associated economic crisis uh, across uh, our various jurisdictions and um this presentation will will emphasize uh, some of those aspects uh, and then i will conclude with a few observations about what this all means for the ongoing work on the tax challenges arising from the digitalization of the economy but as you could see from this slide two of the important pieces of work that we have recently been engaged in is firstly in the context of the covid-19 crisis we've been working with members of the inclusive framework and as you know we have 
137 member jurisdictions uh, that we are working uh, with as part of the inclusive framework. We've been collecting information about measures that have been announced in response to the COVID-19 crisis. And that is a, a very rich uh, data set of material. Uh, it's available on the OECD website. It is regularly updated and it really is a go-to place uh, in terms of public resources available to monitor what governments are doing. So I uh, welcome you all taking advantage of the opportunity to tap into that, that resource. But also at the same time, uh, we had been asked uh, by the G20 in the context uh, of the, the current uh, crisis to provide a paper uh, on the tax and fiscal policy responses to the coronavirus crisis. And uh, we did that in April, uh, around a month ago. That report is available also on the internet. And I encourage you all, if you have an interest in these matters, to, to have a look at that report. Uh, but indeed, many of the issues that are raised in that report will be the basis of the presentation that I'll be giving today. And then, as I indicated, uh, we will talk a little about what does this all mean in the context of the OECD and the Inclusive Framework's ongoing work on the tax challenges arising from the digitalization of the economy. Uh, and we will reflect upon what that means in a concrete sense in terms of next steps. So uh, COVID-19 and the tax policy responses. Uh, clearly, this is an issue that is all consuming for governments at present. And uh, whilst there are many issues that uh, are all competing to attract the attention of policymakers, uh, there are very few issues that are receiving the undivided attention of policymakers in the way that this crisis, uh, the health impacts, but also the broader economic impacts uh, are demanding. And what we see across uh, all countries are a diversity of fiscal responses, but notwithstanding though that diversity, we are seeing uh, that the scale of the response has been uh, truly significant. And, and many implications flow from the significance uh, of that response. But I think as a word of background, it's important to think about the different phases of the crisis because they will, to a large extent, shape and determine the nature of the policy responses that governments will put in place. And at the OECD, the way we like to think about the phases of the crisis are as follows. And the first one is the emergency response. This is when the pandemic was generating the most acute health impacts, um, tragically leading to the loss of, uh, of, of, of many thousands of lives uh, across the globe uh, and in individual jurisdictions, um, uh, very large losses of life, not to mention the other health impacts uh, with the, uh, the debilitating effects of this virus. So the emergency response is that initial phase where governments have to manage with the fact that many of them will be imposing lockdown arrangements within their economy, but at the same time to maintain the connections within the economy that will hopefully be instrumental and central to the recovery when that time comes. Then, of course, at some point after having essentially shut down significant parts of the economy, governments have begun and will continue to move into what we describe as that phase that involves the exit from confinement or the easing of the, the, the stricter restrictions that would otherwise be in place. Now, beyond that, we have the recovery phase. And then beyond the recovery phase, obviously there will be the long-term challenges associated with restoring public finances. Uh, it, it is evident to anyone that has been following these debates that the sheer scale of the intervention from government through the emergency response phase, and this will no doubt continue uh, through the coming phases, uh, is going to put an added burden on the fiscal position of governments as they move forward. Uh, we have seen uh, some significant additional expenditure. We are seeing the impacts of the crisis on the economy and particularly through automatic stabilizers, we are seeing uh, what will be reductions in tax revenues being collected by governments. Uh, those twin, fa twin factors come together to create some enormous challenges as we move forward in terms of ensuring 
that public finances are able to be put onto a sustainable footing. Now, these are all different phases and indeed different policy responses will be required at different phases. Now, if I can focus a little for the phase that has where we have the most empirical data, the most uh, information because it has already been occurring uh, across, across many countries, it's the emergency response phase. And we, when we look at the emergency response phase, we have seen that governments have moved very swiftly, swiftly and decisively uh, to intervene in a range of ways and to provide support to businesses, to households, in some limited cases, uh, to support investment and consumption. But we're also seeing many instances where governments are also uh, getting involved to provide support to the healthcare sector. Now, when we think about the support to businesses, uh, the best way to think about this is about ensuring that governments have been able to try and keep businesses afloat in the short term. So that as we move out of confinement and then ultimately into recovery, as many viable businesses as possible can be kept afloat. Now, um, the main tax priority, and obviously fiscal responses have been tax and broader than tax, but the main tax priority has been to support business cash flow. And uh, this has involved increased lending to firms, where in some cases government has taken on uh, the risk in the form of loan guarantees and, and other uh, more direct interventions. We see the subsidisation of non-wage business costs uh, and support measures that are targeted to specific business sectors. We know, as we heard in some of the introductory remarks, that some sectors in particular have been much more harshly affected because of the, the lockdown arrangements, people's reluctance to engage in activities that they were previously engaged in. And tourism, transport, airlines uh, are not the only ones, but they're certainly some of the more prominent examples. We also see governments intervening to provide subsidies for the self-employed. And we see a range of tax administration and tax policy measures. In particular, we see tax deferral, uh, deferring the point at which tax is to be paid, uh, but also some waivers and some reductions, although they are much rarer than uh, the use of deferral as the principal policy means. In many countries, we've also seen measures being introduced to help businesses keep those connections with their workers. Uh, obviously, the human cost outside of the direct health costs, the human cost of the economic crisis for many will be an impact uh, on their ability to continue to be employed. So in many countries, short term or short time work schemes or wage subsidies paid by government to employers uh, have been an important part of the response. Now, if we have a look uh, across the various countries that have responded to our questionnaire, and that's over 100 jurisdictions, if you look at the different measures and the frequency with which governments have used these measures or deployed these measures, you see that uh, deferral of tax payments is clearly the most popular and the most common. Uh, almost 80% of jurisdictions opting for that measure. Um, tax filing extensions, also very popular, more flexible tax debt repayment arrangements, enhanced tax refunds, particularly for VAT, but for also uh, other forms of taxes, and to a lesser extent, reduced social security contributions, and in some cases, enhanced loss offset provisions. Uh, but interesting to see that tax deferrals really continue to be the principal means that have been relied upon. When we look at specific measures to boost business cash flow from a tax administration and tax policy perspective, um, once again, tax filing, deferral, enhanced tax refunds. Uh, from a tax policy perspective, we see some reductions in employer social security contributions uh, and also enhanced tax loss provisions, carry forward and carry backward provisions in particular. In addition to supporting businesses, there have been a number of specific efforts to try and step in and support vulnerable households. Uh, countries have moved very swiftly in this respect, uh, and we see a range of measures that have been put in place. Partial unemployment schemes for workers that continue to be employed, we, we have seen that. Um, we've seen increased eligibility of cash transfers, 
We've seen increased access to benefits generally, and we've seen those benefits increase in terms of the quantum that's currently made available. Uh, of course, in every jurisdiction, the policy responses will be different, and often that will be driven by a range of jurisdiction-specific factors. I think it's fair to say that one of the key driving considerations that governments have been, uh, have been influenced by has been their ability to get support into the system and into the pockets of those who need it as quickly as possible. And that will vary from country to country. So for example, where a country has uh, a sophisticated existing transfer system in place, that may be the method that is preferred. Um, it may be through the tax system. It may be through other existing methods. Obviously, if you have to create new mechanisms for uh, getting that money out to its recipients, then that will take time. And time is something uh, that in the emergency response phase uh, is, is of the essence. So uh, that is very much one of the considerations that governments have taken into account. Now, we have seen some instances of where governments have put in place limited measures to incentivize investment and to support consumption. I guess the challenge with these responses in the emergency response phase is that it's really hard to promote investment and consumption at a time when you're also taking health related measures to contain consumption and investment, uh, locking down parts of the economy shutting down many shops and retail outlets, uh, shutting down tourism-related activity. Um, these measures are obviously going to render your efforts to stimulate consumption in those areas uh, quite, uh, quite futile. So to some extent, these measures, even though we've seen some governments implement them, we think that they will be more important, particularly in the recovery phase. And this is a space to watch because we would expect a lot more to be happening in this space in the future. Now, uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, worth some reflection and an interesting um, part of the presentation to reflect upon, and that is some of the measures that governments have put in place specifically to address uh, the health sector. Uh, obviously, uh, healthcare workers and the health sector have, has been on the front line of this emergency response, and making sure that um, there is sufficient labour supply, uh, that health workers um, are rewarded for their efforts and incentivized to continue to uh, do the uh, very important work that they do on the front line has meant that some specific measures, and in some cases, some novel measures have been announced by governments. So we see in some cases, personal income tax and or social security contribution uh, being reduced for health sector workers. We see measures to increase the number of health sector health sector workers and uh, some of the ones that are interesting here has been uh, encouraging retired workers to come back into the, the, the workforce um, and one way of doing that is to ensure that they're not penalized in terms of their entitlement to pension benefits uh, or pension rights. Uh, we've seen a number of countries do that. We see some specific business tax rate cut measures or accelerated tax depreciation measures targeted uh, at the health sector, particularly around health equipment, goods and services. We see VAT exemptions or rate reductions for specific products uh, in the, the medicines, uh, medical equipment and services area, particularly where they're targeted towards um, uh, activities that are directly connected with the response to the virus. We see uh, measures to expedite customs clearance of goods in support of uh, the health situation. Uh, tax support for medical and charitable donations, and even a couple of novel measures from governments that have been encouraging the take up of payments by credit card and contactless type payments uh, to reduce uh, the, uh, the, the, the touch factor, if you like, in uh, handing over uh, money um, and uh, allowing for uh, those online transactions to become an even more seamless and uh, predominant uh, means of, of exchange. Now, uh, just a word, um, uh, the report that we did to the G20 was focused on OECD and G20 countries, but just to, to make the observation that even beyond the OECD and the G20, 
Uh, in many developing countries, we've seen similar patterns in terms of the uh, various policies that have been announced. Uh, obviously, um, uh, many uh, emerging market economies uh, and also developing countries face added challenges in terms of the informal market or the informal sector, and that has required some specific responses. Uh, but we have also seen some governments, particularly uh, in low income and developing countries, do things such as um, address um, longer term policy reforms in this emergency response phase. Uh, we don't necessarily encourage that. We think that uh, structural reforms are probably best to wait a little longer, uh, but um, as long as the objectives of those reforms are consistent with the objectives that were stated around emergency response, uh, that may not be harmful. So uh, I've spoken a lot about the emergency response phase, but now just to turn our minds a little to the exit, to uh, the gradual, partial and intermittent deconfinement that we might expect. Uh, here I'm in uh, presenting live uh, from Paris in my apartment, as so many workers uh, in this city uh, continue to do, even though the French government decided from the 11th of May to begin to ease restrictions and to begin a process of gradual deconfinement. Now, the experience here in France is not dissimilar to what's being experienced in many other jurisdictions uh, at present. And for many jurisdictions, this will be uh, the, the next step that they will be moving to uh, in the coming days and weeks. But there is, of course, a lot of uncertainty around the nature and the length of what deconfinement might look like. Um, prolonged containment, that's the period of lockdown, that increases the risks of an erosion of worker-specific capital. Uh, it risks uh, an increase in defaults on mortgages and loans, and it puts more pressure on firm bankruptcies. Uh, apart from the overall impact on the general macroeconomic circumstances of the country uh, in conditions where demand is being uh, artificially suppressed by the, the health response. So the longer countries are in containment, uh, obviously that may well be the right policy from a health perspective and, and there's a balancing uh, set of considerations that governments have to reflect upon here. But clearly the longer uh, governments keep countries in containment uh, and, and lockdown, the more severe those economic implications are likely to be. But that's a really challenging and difficult balancing act for governments to consider. Uh, but um, when governments are able to begin the process of deconfinement, uh, that will limit some of the risks of more permanent damage uh, and economic contagion flowing from the shorter term economic effects of what the lockdown measures might require. Uh, now, um, the, the harder uh, we're affected by those measures, the greater the, the risks of prolonged recession, and to some extent, uh, the policies through this period will have an eye on both the health management issues, but also those economic consequences. But of course, it is worth noting that um, uh, all countries are affected, some more so than others, but probably worth just acknowledging that for many developing countries, they've been particularly hard hit. Uh, often they have a lot less fiscal space to begin with. Uh, so that means that their response has either been uh, constrained or where it's not been constrained, there could still be adverse implications from um, the, the significant increase in public debt that might be generated. Many developing countries have been, their fortunes are linked to commodity prices and we've seen some very big reductions in commodity prices. Uh, tourism can be a very important part of the, the local economic base and uh, anything that might encourage uh, capital flows to reverse or, or the outflow of capital uh, is dangerous. And of course, uh, for many countries, remittances are hugely significant where workers have moved abroad to take advantage of labour opportunities and are remitting funds back uh, to their families and loved ones uh, back in their home country, uh, even those remittances are likely to be affected. So uh, this is uh, a particularly challenging time, we think, for those uh, in developing countries. 
Now, uh, a few further observations around um, deconfinement. Uh, obviously, tax policy will continue to support the economy uh, and need to adapt to the changing risk. Um, and, and one other uncertainty that I should have just mentioned is that it's not clear at this point whether or not uh, de deconfinement will be linear. Uh, will it just be the end of confinement and then we gradually phase our way into recovery? Or will there in some cases be a resumed or refreshed outbreak of cases that requires some form of confinement again. Now, obviously, that would be um, bring much more severe economic consequences if that were to be the case, but that's a, a point of uncertainty that we all live with and only time will tell us more on that front. But in terms of the tax policy responses, uh, we have to continue to make sure that we support those businesses that would otherwise be viable uh, through this period. Uh, and that means continuing to support things like tax deferrals, uh, loss carry back, particularly if the benefit of that can be provided in a timely fashion, um, some temporary reductions or exemptions, accelerated VAT refunds, uh, ongoing wage and income support and support for consumption, which in some cases will be direct uh, assistance to governments. Now, assuming that we're able to move uh, relatively seamlessly uh, from the deconfinement phase into a recovery phase. It's worth acknowledging that there will be potentially some pent up demand. Uh, some households uh, who have not been able to spend some of the money that they've been able to continue to earn during that period may have an ability and a willingness to spend uh, as uh, we move into deconfinement and beyond. Uh, but that won't be the case for all households. Uh, it'll be a, a gradual transition and there's also the risk of an uneven recovery across businesses and households. So even though it may be that restrictions are being eased, it may be some reluctance on the part of individuals to avail themselves of certain uh, business activities. Um, uh, travel, tourism, for example, uh, will not just be affected by the willingness of governments to impose restrictions, but obviously there will be some consumers who will take decisions uh, to risk on the side of caution, as it were. And that may also mean that uh, they will divert some of their, their spending power into certain sectors, perhaps at the exclusion of others. Uh, so we would expect an uneven recovery. It's important to evaluate the need for short-term responses. The extent to which governments will need to fire up their fiscal power and deploy it will depend to some extent on um, what the state of overall demand is in that period of recovery uh, and the extent to which it might, might require some state support. Uh, now, of course, there may well need to be for a period some coexistence between uh, containment or quasi-containment or uh, partial deconfinement policies with policies tailored for the economic recovery. Uh, of course, the quicker the rebound, um, it's not clear how quick that rebound will be. Uh, some people were talking about the possibility of a V-shaped recovery. That seems to be, um, there's uh, less of an expectation of that today than there, there was perhaps a few months ago. Um, but depending on how quick that recovery is, it could cause upward price pressures, particularly in some sectors uh, because of the uneven nature uh, of, uh, of the recovery. Now, uh, there may well be a need for some additional stimulus. Uh, to the extent that that's necessary, it would want to be targeted uh, at uh, stimulating demand. Uh, it should be temporary to not um, bake in or build in structural changes to the tax base uh, or the expenditure base. And um, it should typically target less affluent households and also non-standard workers because of the particular vulnerabilities that they face. But um, lower income households typically have a higher propensity to consume that additional money that they receive. And that will uh, generally, and the, the evidence is quite clear on this, will generally stimulate a greater response in terms of, of demand. Uh, now, to the extent that these actions can be coordinated, uh, that is important. Uh, and we need to be thinking about how they can also strengthen our resilience. Uh, I guess one point that we would make very, very strongly is that uh, for many economies, recovery 
is still a phase that we are working towards. And even when we feel as though we are in the midst of the recovery, it will be crucial for governments to ensure that the recovery has been locked in and is going to be durable to some extent. Because the next phase, which is about thinking about um, how we might implement measures to make our fiscal policies and our public finances more sustainable in the long run, those policies will inevitably involve some decisions on the spending and the tax side that will reduce demand. Before we move into that phase, we need to make sure that we have our economies locked into a sustainable recovery. Uh, and we need to ensure that we limit and mitigate the risks of what could be the, the prospect of double dip recessions for countries that might find themselves in that situation. So this is a point that we, we make very, very strongly. And even though the conversation on long-term policy responses has already begun, government should be very careful about jumping to this phase too soon because they need to make sure that uh, the underlying strength of their economies uh, can be fostered and nurtured through this period. So what might some of the policy considerations that governments need to be thinking about in that longer term policy response look like? Now, obviously, there's been big increases in public spending, albeit many of them temporary in their nature. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, what we would expect will be significant losses in tax revenues. Obviously, there's always a lag. Uh, and we haven't seen the full extent of what this means, but there will be reduced tax revenues being collected because of the nature of uh, both measures directly put in place by governments, but also much more profoundly because of the economic implications of reduced demand uh, and uh, reduced growth across our economies. Uh, now, all of that will uh, have an adverse impact on the budgetary and debt situation of governments. And governments will have to, with a view to the medium and longer term, think about how they're able to essentially pay for the responses that we've put in place. Now, this, the fiscal space uh, available in different jurisdictions will vary, and that will have a very big impact on the range of options available to countries. So, so let's be very clear about that. The, the responses will, to a large extent, uh, be shaped by the country-specific circumstances that, that you face. Um, now, that debate that has emerged and is beginning, um, the consideration around how some of the, uh, the costs of uh, responding to this crisis might be paid for uh, with uh, structural changes or uh, even some medium term interim responses uh, as we prepare for that stage. We see some commentators already beginning to talk about the, the potential for the imp implementation of exceptional measures uh, for example, uh, we've seen in, in other, you know, quite unusual and um, exceptional fiscal uh, events, uh, external shocks like wars, for example, we have seen some uh, specific exceptional measures put in place. Will this be another opportunity for that? Well, that's a question that many are asking. Uh, some options that we've seen commentators discussing is uh, the possibility of of seeking to tax back the additional income earned by some who have benefited from the crisis. Uh, it may involve uh, the use of broadly based solidarity levies where there is a demand or a, a desire to make uh, everyone contribute something uh, in addition to what they've previously paid in order to help pay for some of the costs of uh, responding to the current crisis. Uh, and we see um, uh, a little bit in the context of the debate around exceptional measures, also debates around whether or not uh, excess or super profit taxes uh, might be something that should be considered. Obviously, we have longer term challenges in terms of climate change and building resilience in our economies to the inevitable decarbonisation uh, that will be required in order to meet the sorts of commitments that countries signed up to in Paris. Uh, and that may well present uh, this as a moment in time where some of those longer term structural changes uh, might uh, be considered. We would also say that there's an important discussion to be had around the taxation of capital income, both capital gains, but capital income more broadly. 
Uh, we see most countries taxing capital much more lightly than labour. There are some reasons for that, uh, some good reasons for that. Uh, others that have uh, some of their uh, origins in um, a bygone era where there was a belief that um, capital could easily be hidden offshore and on that basis um, reduced levels of tax might discourage, or might discourage people from uh, relocating or encourage them to, to continue to, uh, to book their capital returns in the local jurisdiction. We think that the big changes that have happened to the automatic exchange of taxpayer information have been a game changer in this respect and probably do require a rethink of capital taxation in that context. So we think this is an area where there's a lot of discussion still to be had. And then of course, at a time where we see such an acceleration of digitalization, the fact that rather than uh, me being uh, in, uh, in, in India, uh, uh, promoting uh, and presenting uh, the work of the OECD, uh, I'm doing that virtually here from Paris. Um, we're doing that in large part because we're required to do it in the current circumstances, but we do think that some of these changes will be particularly sticky and they will remain and there will be legacies that live on beyond the current crisis. Uh, in that environment, the, the questions that we've been grappling with in the context of the tax challenges arising from the digitalization of the economy will continue to be an area uh, rife uh, for ongoing work uh, particularly at the multilateral level. And of course, for many low-income countries in particular, uh, we know that domestic resource mobilisation uh, will continue to be a very, very crucial issue. So uh, having um, spent uh, most of the presentation talking about COVID-19, uh, government responses and what the future might hold, I'd now like to just spend a few moments talking about what this might mean for uh, one of the, the flagship pieces of work that the OECD has been working on over the last couple of years. This is the tax and digitalization work. Uh, obviously, India has been one of the key partners that we've been working through these issues with, uh, and uh, India continues to be a key contributor to these discussions at the global level. I think it's worth noting that uh, while many businesses have faced, have faced unprecedented difficulties, uh, some have seen increased profitability through this period. And, and many of them have been those that have been highly digitalized firms. Uh, some of the, the very tech firms uh, that have been the subject of much commentary in the context of the work around the tax challenges arising from digitalization. Those who, by virtue of their business models, uh, really um, operate in a new economic reality that is not reflected in the traditional tax rules that are very deeply rooted in notions of physical presence. Now, they are the issues that gave rise to the discussions at the global level around uh, taxing um, in a digital world. Uh, and those challenges have certainly not gone away. If anything, I think they've been brought onto the agenda in even sharper and starker relief for policymakers to consider. Uh, indeed, um, as one of the earlier speakers, I can't recall exactly who made this, this introductory comment, but as we see, uh, many vendors that we traditionally would have dealt with in person, uh, they've been required to shut down their, their businesses in part, to close their doors. Uh, at the same time, uh, those that are able to engage with us online, many of which can do so easily without any physical presence in our jurisdiction, have seen an increase in their profitability and their fortunes have uh, been reversed uh, compared to those that operate in a more physical environment. Now, it's hard to observe those changes so directly without recognising uh, the ongoing deficiencies that exist within the international tax system. We've been very frank about these deficiencies at the OECD level, that's what we're working to address. Uh, so in that sense, even though governments are totally consumed with the challenges of, uh, of COVID and what that means, uh, and will be for many years to come, uh, this is definitely a case where uh, the ongoing work of the tax challenges arising from digitalization continues to be of crucial importance. Now, uh, we also, um, in that context of needing to secure our 
finances, our public finances moving forward. We can also see that uh, things like pillar one and pillar two will be important. And indeed, I think pillar two with uh, a desire to have a minimum level of taxation being imposed upon uh, corporations, regardless of where that tax is collected, is something that there only appears to be a growing sense of momentum for that type of initiative. I think that as governments come under even more fiscal pressure, their tolerance for uh, aggressive uh, base erosion and profit shifting uh, will only diminish. Uh, the desire of the general public to see governments uh, take to those sorts of practices with an even more aggressive set of policy responses, I think means that the support at the international level for something along the lines of Pillar 2 has uh, only increased significantly in recent times. So I think just as, as Pillar 1 continues to be relevant uh, because of the accelerated digitalization of the economy, uh, and the distortions that we see that that creates, uh, so too do we see with Pillar 2 uh, a, a very uh, important set of dynamics that will ensure that that will continue to be uh, an important part of the policy agenda. And of course, we know that international cooperation will be necessary. If governments go off and do their own thing unilaterally, that will lead to distortions, it will lead to double taxation, uh, and uh, it will if current models of unilateral measures are anything to go by, where they are based almost exclusively on taxing gross receipts, uh, they are exactly the sorts of taxes that will do the most harm in the current environment. Now, let me explain. One of the great things about our corporate income tax or most corporate income taxes as they've been designed over the years is that they essentially operate as an automatic stabiliser. They uh, they have an effect that, um, that cushions some of their normal effects during economic downturns. And one of the most significant ways they do that is through only taxing net profits and doing so in a way that allows for losses to be carried forward. So you don't pay corporate income tax typically when you're not making a profit. And when you've experienced a significant shock, you normally have a period of time where you can carry forward the impact of that, uh, those losses in order to reduce future tax liability until uh, you start to come out the back end of that. Now, if you have taxes that tax gross receipts only, then they operate very differently. And even though we mentioned a little bit earlier that some business models in the digital space have done exceptionally well through this period, let's not forget that there are other digital models that have been uh, quite seriously and adversely affected by the current arrangements as well. So if you happen to be a platform that is operating in the tourism space, for example, or a platform that's operating in the ride sharing space, then um, yes, you're a digital platform. Yes, you can operate without physical presence, but your business model is connected to underlying physical businesses some of which in those cases have been suppressed and contained as part of these policy responses. Now, if you have systems of uh, taxation that are taxing turnover rather than profit, then those particular, particularly if they're targeted at specific firms, then we will see many of those firms will see uh, with these in these, uh, the, the increase in these unilateral measures, an increase in taxation at a time where they may actually be even less profitable than they were uh, just six months or a year ago. So all of this, I think, uh, means that th there is a real uh, sense of importance and urgency, notwithstanding the fact that even more urgent matters uh, have now arrived on the agenda, but there is a continued urgency to deal with these questions around the taxation challenges of uh, arising from digitalization. And just uh, my final slide before I, I, I finish up, and I, I hope we will have some time still for questions, uh, looks at the timeline as we move forward. Now, uh, the timeline has been affected a little. Uh, we have consistently been working towards the delivery of a consensus-based solution by the end of the year, by the end of 2020. We had hoped to reach high-level agreement in July of this year at an inclusive framework meeting. That's not going to be possible. 
largely because of the, the COVID uh, issue and its impact. Obviously, the work is ongoing. Uh, the technical work of the working parties at the OECD uh, with the 137 jurisdictions all operating and contributing on an equal footing. Uh, the steering group, which India is represented on, uh, they have been leading the work forward and moving it forward in a virtual environment. Uh, but we have rescheduled the plenary of the inclusive framework. There'll be a virtual meeting in July instead of the face-to-face -face one, but we hope to have a full plenary meeting in October. And at that meeting, we are seeking to reach uh, consensus on the key policy features uh, of what the package might look like. And the intention would be to then be able to report back on those outcomes to the G20 finance minister, uh, ministers at their meeting in October. And of course, the G20 leaders summit uh, will be in November uh, and uh, we will be seeking to, uh, to deliver um, uh, at that point. Now, obviously uh, the challenges are enormous um, Breaching consensus has always been challenging. In the current environment, it's even more challenging. There's no question about that. Uh, but there are many good reasons as to why governments um, continue to see this as being of great significance. Yes, there is less bandwidth um, to deal with these issues in an environment where governments are dealing with more pressing and immediate um, uh, policy questions of even greater import. Um, because of the scale of them. Uh, but we do see uh, an ongoing uh, willingness on the part of governments to reach a consensus-based solution. We're working very hard with them to try and achieve that. And uh, we certainly would love to have the opportunity uh, to continue to keep uh, you all updated on the progress of these matters. Uh, as I said before, uh, the uh, Bombay Accounting uh, Society um, is, uh, is, is a, uh, an important stakeholder, um, chartered accountants all around the world, but uh, the relationship we've had in particular with uh, Bombay means that we will be very keen to come back and to keep you abreast of these developments as and when there is more to report on. So I'll leave my presentation there, uh, more than happy to, to take any questions or engage in uh, any further discussion in the remaining time. Thank you, Mr. Bradbury, for your lovely presentation. And I, this presentation, now we can keep this question answer questions uh, answer session. So people are entitled to put the questions. They can ask the questions by unmuting the mic. Or alternatively, chat room is also available to send the question. I have not seen any questions come up on the chat. chat. I have a few questions for you, Mr. Bradbury that uh, the whatever presentation you made to us, it seems the government of India has taken all the measures virtually copying from OECD. Have you been advising government of India or what? Uh, look, um, uh, we have not been specifically advising uh, the government of India, but what we have sought to do uh, with all of, of the members of the inclusive framework has been to ensure that they have access to uh, information on um, the types of measures that we would see as being most effective. And we did that very early on. We released a, a short summary brochure of the types of measures that governments may wish to consider. And then through the sharing of information, we have sought to bring together policy responses uh, from all of our, our member jurisdictions and to make that available so that policymakers in India and in all other countries are able to, in a very um, quick and timely fashion, have a look at what other jurisdictions are doing, uh, make an assessment about the extent to which that is relevant for their jurisdiction, and to act decisively uh, to take the necessary steps in order uh, to cushion the impacts of the containment measures and the flow on economic effects that uh, will come from that. So uh, we have not been making direct policy recommendations to, to India, uh, but we certainly have been following developments very closely. We, we think that uh, the measures align very closely with best practice internationally. Uh, and uh, to the extent that uh, the information that we've been able to provide has supported India in its efforts, uh, I can only say we, we are delighted if that has been the case. 
uh, but it's certainly not because we were making direct policy recommendations. And, and one of the reasons we've been reluctant to do that is that we really do recognize that, to use an expression that I, I might uh, typically use, is that we believe it's horses for courses. And it is important for individual jurisdictions to make these judgments. A sovereign nation's better understanding the local and national considerations and, and specificities uh, to design the sort of package that is going to work best for them. We can outline the principles, we can outline and, and share best practice, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, I, I'm sitting uh, maybe not in an ivory tower in Paris in my apartment in, 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 instead, uh, but uh, we are a long way away from dealing with the realities on the ground uh, in India. And we recognise uh, that on these sorts of sovereign tax policy questions, that's a matter for India. Uh, but certainly, we hope that uh, we've been able to assist in some way. I asked you that question with some something in my background, in my mind. You see, you people are from developed countries. So migration of workers from one place to another place is not a problem. You might have not closed the transportation, railways and this and that. But in India, the railways and the public transport, the buses, everything was closed. Lockdown means lockdown. So as a result, uh, the people who have come to cities, major cities from the rural areas, they are very hard to uh, mouth to people. There are hardly any earnings they have got. They no food two times. Daily food is not available to them. And they started migrating to their own villages by walking for miles and miles together. And that brought the pressure on the government of India. And in fact, we are talking about social distancing and, uh, and the, uh, the thousands and uh, uh, millions of people gathering at one place for getting out from the cities. And that was prevented, that happened. So whether these solutions which you have given as a general package, does it have any exceptions or that the standard rule should apply everywhere? Now you are talking about social security contribution reduction and all those things. But the countries and countries give social security benefit to the citizens. Our country, we don't have a social security benefit to the people at all. So in such situation, do the uh, is it not the country should customize the problem solutions for themselves or they just copy the OECD regulations, recommendations? Yeah, look, absolutely. You, you, you're spot on there that what you've just said highlights and emphasizes the importance of uh, local solutions that are tailored to the circumstances in, in the local community, the local national uh, context. And indeed, uh, that can vary uh, significantly from region to region within a national context. So uh, there is no one size fits all. And we're very, very conscious of, of not wanting people to look at what we put out and say, uh, the OECD says that that's exactly what we need to do because um, what works in one environment may not work elsewhere. But sharing best practice, uh, we hope, helps. Uh, some of the internal migration questions that you're pointing to there, you know, they are um, hugely challenging uh, and uh, they, they, they are playing out in different ways in different countries. Uh, even in, for example, in, in parts of Europe, we saw a lot of internal migration going on, maybe not necessarily on foot, uh, but we saw a lot of that happening as people wanted to, to go back and be somewhere closer to home, wherever that might, might be, uh, through the period of this. Uh, now, we've also seen countries put in place restrictions at the borders uh, that have limited some of those flows. Now, that may not be something that can be done uh, within the national context. So uh, what works in one environment is not necessarily going to be the best fit for another. So absolutely, uh, these principles need to be applied uh, locally, and that's where we are very, very cautious about not wanting to be seen to be making uh, rigid recommendations, because at the end of the day, uh, local governments, after all, are the ones that will be accountable to their constituencies and to their, their people for uh, the uh, uh, effectiveness of their response. Uh, and they need to, to, to do what they, they think is appropriate in those circumstances. But we hope that uh, the sharing of best practice at least can give them some, some guidance or perhaps shape uh, some of the directions that they head in, in terms of the policy response. Mr. Bradbury, you mentioned that uh, the aggressive tax avoidance and evasion 
uh, should be taken care in this uh, pandemic situation and post pandemic uh, should be done is it that if you do too much of it it will amount to tax terrorism you know the tax the officers then try to harass the taxpayer so is it not a case of a tax terrorism you have been talking about so much of aggressive tax uh, 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 aggressive uh, tax avoidance and tax evasion beps and all those actions prime principal purpose test and all sort of things which you have talked uh, talk to the to, to told to the world and they have been following is it not resulting into tax terrorism which the taxpayer you know you people are giving solution only to the government revenue officers and not talking about the taxpayers rights so is it not that case of tax terrorism uh, look i think that uh, tax certainty has to be a natural partner of any efforts to uh, reduce uh, the potential for base erosion and profit shifting activity uh, i think that um, it, it will be important as governments move into um, not just the recovery phase but the longer term uh, fiscal uh, balancing phase where the extent to which um, you know administrations are able to provide tax certainty and deal with taxpayers in a fair and consistent way uh, could potentially have implications in terms of investment choices that uh, corporations will make in the longer term so uh, i think that uh, to the extent that there might be tax administrations that uh, might uh, be in some danger of becoming too aggressive that needs to be borne in mind that uh, certainty will be an important part of securing long-term investment uh, for the country into the future I think uh, the point I was seeking to make more than anything uh, in saying that this is going to be uh, a bigger issue than perhaps it was before uh, was before is that in the same way as after the the, the big uh, global crisis and recession uh, that occurred in 2008 2009 um, when you come out the back end of, of these crises and when governments have to begin that really difficult phase, of raising more revenue to reduce their debt and try and get their budgets back into some semblance of balance. They will need to lean upon a whole range of tax levers. And some of those will involve the average person having to pay more tax. Um, for example, if you make changes around um, you know, GST, consumption taxes, if you make changes around personal income taxes, uh, if you make changes around other specific consumption taxes, they will impact individuals. Um, now, if governments are going to have to raise some of those taxes, and when you look at the magnitude of the financing challenge that will come once recovery is, is locked in, um, then uh, experience has shown us, we believe, that there will be a lot of public pressure to ensure that there is some sharing of the burden. And um, one of the issues that I, I suspect will attract a lot of attention will be any instances of uh, aggressive tax minimisation on the part of multinational enterprises. To the extent that um, there may be some high profile instances of companies engaging in structuring or aggressive activities to reduce their tax liability. I suspect that the general public will be expecting governments to, uh, to not have much tolerance for that. Uh, so it's really that dynamic that I was seeking to point to, but obviously, um, you know, governments have to, uh, they, they have to provide certainty to the extent that they can. Long-term certainty will support, support long-term investment. Uh, if people, and administrations in countries, wherever they may be located, are engaged in an arbitrary activity where they are not able to guarantee the rule of law, then obviously that will have an adverse impact on uh, investment uh, opportunities in the longer term. Uh, and that's something that governments and tax administrations need to weigh up. If I could just make one final point on this. I had a, I've had a number of in, uh, interactions with tax administrations in recent times. Uh, and um, one of the really interesting things that tax administrations have been saying uh, is that 
those workers within tax administrations on the front line, they are very, very nervous about the balancing act required to do their job. As we move from this period where a whole range of concessions are essentially being provided to taxpayers, such as deferral of taxes, some concessionality on interest and penalties that might otherwise be made payable. Um, and as we move from that world to a world where there will be more pressure on tax administrations to eventually collect some of those debts and contribute to replenishing the, the, the fiscal coffers, uh, that that puts tax administrators on the front line in what will be a very challenging balancing act for them. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's a, the, the points that you make uh, are very important ones, uh, but um, some sort of balance ultimately is the approach that I think um, should be struck. Sir, you mentioned uh, in one of your presentations on the capital taxation. And uh, you said something, you mixed up two things, capital taxation and capital gain taxation. What is that point, if you can little elaborate? Because uh, do you suggest that the capital gain tax should be abolished or should be reduced in situation like COVID-19? Or you are talking about introduction of capital tax on a capital, that is wealth tax. What is that uh, point which you are trying to highlight, I suggest? Sure. So, um, uh, taxing capital, capital income uh, is essentially the way we tax returns on the investment of our capital. Okay, capital gains. Uh, so, it could be capital gains, but it could be the income, uh, the returns that we gain on capital investment. So, when I'm talking about capital investment, um, you know, right across the spectrum, um, what do we invest our capital in? You know, we might put it in the bank and we, we, we earn a return in the form of interest. And that's either taxed or not taxed in a certain way. We might invest our capital in ownership of equities and we will get a capital gain, yes, that may or may not be subject to capital gains tax depending on the regime, uh, but we will get a recurrent return on that investment in the form of dividends and dividends will be taxed or not taxed or to what, to what extent would depend on the jurisdiction. We may choose to invest our capital in a property, uh, real estate, uh, and we will get a capital gain that will either be taxed or not taxed through capital gains tax, but we get a recurrent return on that in the form of rental. Uh, now, what we see across most countries is quite a divergent approach to the taxation of capital and capital income in particular across the various potential investment vehicles that might be available. Uh, another important area are pension funds or retirement savings vehicles. Uh, and so when you think about the decisions that a, a self-interested rational investor might consider in terms of where they might invest their capital, if they're thinking about the full spectrum of those investment opportunities, they'll be looking at the return that is available in any of those given investment opportunities. But a key element of that assessment of the return will be the tax treatment of the return across those different types of investment opportunities. And what we typically see, and we did a study on this just uh, two years ago with OECD and some G20 countries, uh, and we see some very, very different tax arrangements in place across different investment opportunities. Now, if you tax one type of investment more lightly than another, that's gonna have a distortive effect and it's gonna encourage people to invest in one particular channel of investment compared to others. These distortions, they, from an economist perspective, they affect uh, the efficiency of the way we allocate resources. And that's not a good thing. We would prefer to have greater neutrality in that sense. Now, sometimes the lack of neutrality that exists in the way we tax capital income is driven by concessions that we provide to some forms of investment compared to others. We're saying it may well be time to look at, at undoing some of those special concessions or preferences, because not only are they providing, in some cases, excessively generous tax treatment of capital returns, but they're also distorting the investment choices that investors may wish, wish to make. 
And this could be a good time to rethink some of those questions. Uh, that's very country specific, uh, but we see it right across uh, many countries where there are these particular preferences in place. Now could be an important time to think about uh, removing some of those distortions. Sir, you said uh, some incentives should be granted to health sector workers and uh, reduction in the rate of tax or some other incentives. We don't see such thing happening in India. Health sector workers, though they have been given some preferential treatment uh, in terms because number of people, uh, when they are treating the people, they are dying. Most of the health workers are dying. So what sort of recommendations do you have got for the government to follow for the health sector workers? Now, now this is an area where it, it will depend a lot on um, the, the political economy of, of the, local, uh, the local country. Um, and, and how people see these things. Um, I, I guess what we have observed, and, and we're not recommending this, but what we have observed is some countries have said, well, there should be some recognition of the fact that a particular class of workers here is subjecting themselves to particular harms in order to help the country respond to the crisis. Now, some countries have provided bonuses you don't necessarily have to use the tax system in order to okay, do this, okay, okay. Uh, but there might be a bonus that's put in place, or it may be some form of tax concession. We, we, don't, we don't necessarily see one as being better than the other, but we observe that countries have been determined to do this. Perhaps the one that's been most interesting for us has been to see those countries that have relaxed some of the pension requirements to encourage retired workers to come back into the workforce. Uh, that's been interesting to see, um, but once again, it depends a lot on the way you tax retirement savings at the moment and pensions. Um, you, it may be that they're not currently posing a barrier to people coming back into the workforce anyway. And of course, many people, particularly in the health pr profession, which is a profession that you know people generally go into with a desire to help humanity and help the public interest, Many people will choose to come back and to contribute because of their mission uh, to support humanity and the health care of their fellow citizens and may not need uh, that degree of support. But I guess where governments might think that it's appropriate to think about providing that support, we have shared some examples of what governments have done uh, so that they can think about whether that's aligned with uh, the practices that other countries are employing. Some of the countries have a lot of uh, un, unrecorded wealth in the hands of the people, which is not taxed. Is it a time that the government should come out with some amnesty or some concessional rate of tax to uh, generate a lot of uh, income, revenue out of that? And also some of the assets which are held by the people like gold. In a country like India, every human being here would be having some gold or the other. And therefore, uh, uh, the immense amount of the total gold reserve held by individuals in India, which is not reflected in their books. If the government taps it by way of uh, bringing out some gold amnesty scheme by asking people to pay some concessional rate of tax and then collect that gold so that they can print more notes so that which is available for circulation to improve the economy. Do you, have you recommended any such schemes to the government? But not, not specifically for gold, but, but obviously gold is one particular commodity where in times such as these, you would expect its value to increase just because uh, it is often uh, a means by which people can uh, hedge against uncertainty and it is a safe haven uh, asset in that sense. So, um, you know, that's, that's a particular, there is a particular set of circumstances around gold that that governments may want to, to think about before taking any policy action there. But on the question more generally about hidden wealth, uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, we think that this is a time when governments need to be thinking about how they can ensure some transparency around that hidden wealth. Uh, India has, uh, through a, a series of uh, policy measures, has sought to bring some of that wealth uh, into the tax net and, and into the, the sunlight, as it were. Uh, I guess one thing, we, we have some reluctance about amnesties per se, but we do think that 
um, particularly when things like the common reporting standard or the automatic exchange of information uh, was being implemented, that there is a case for giving people a chance uh, to normalise and disclose their arrangements before those regimes come into effect. Uh, that's not an unusual approach where, where a new regime is coming in, is to, to give people the opportunity to come clean uh, and uh, regularise their arrangements. Uh, but, um, of course, any government that provides amnesties has to be careful that, um, you know, on one occasion, it's an amnesty. Um, if it's a repeat type of situation, that might uh, really weaken the message that this is a once and a last opportunity to come forward and to, uh, to, to come clean, as it were, with the tax authorities. So I think, you know, there's always a balancing act. But when it comes to, to taxation of capital, um, hidden wealth is one of the things that we have in our in our mind as, as needing to be targeted as uh, as uh, part of the overall policy response in the longer term. A few, a few questions which have come from the chat box. One of the question is: Is the increased world of digitization in the in the increased world of digitization, don't you think that the developing nation or a market economy has a larger role to play? Because market is here. The, the digital players are taking customers from a country like ours and China. Yes. Uh, look, I, I think if you look at the, the nature of the debate that we've been having around Pillar 1 and the uh, tax challenges addressing the, uh, the digitalization of the economy, uh, you see that a key element of uh, the proposal that is uh, still the subject of ongoing discussion, but the essential proposal around the unified approach um, is to put more taxing rights in the market jurisdiction. Uh, and that is because, um, you know, digitalization has meant that the, the notion of source and residence may not those notions may not be as directly relevant. Destination may in fact be um, as relevant in some of these contexts. Now, destination can be where a final sale occurs or it could be the location of a user in the case of a, a more highly digitalized business model. Now, um, the, the advantage of taxing at the location of destination uh, is that um, there is less opportunity for people to engage in tax planning in order to avoid taxes that apply at destination. Um, shifting the location of your customer is much more difficult to do um, in the tax planning section uh, of a multinational. Whereas shifting uh, the location of your underlying business functions is something that, that can be done. Uh, sometimes it can be done uh, in an artificial way uh, in the form of base erosion and profit shifting related activities. In some cases, it can be done uh, in a way that actually shifts real economic functions. Um, but the customer or the user, uh, they are factors that are much less mobile and much less vulnerable to uh, to tax planning. It doesn't mean that they are perfect, a perfect basis upon which to, act, to allocate taxing rights. There are still some challenges there, but uh, I think that the the ongoing logic that underpins the work on Pillar One uh, has been uh, brought into much sharper contrast because of these recent developments. Yes. We have Mr. Rajat Bansal, who is a Chief Commissioner of Income Tax and also is a member of the Tax Committee of the United Nations. And he also represented in OECD as well. Now, he has a very interesting question for you to be answered by you. He says, the present crisis has hit the developing countries harder. You refer to the importance of the domestic resources mobilization for developing countries. You also referred to the increased importance of consensus on the digital economy taxation in the context of present crisis. Do you think that some thinking on the part of the developed countries and the OECD on allocating the taxing rights 
under the tax treaty is needed under the present crisis and this to support this statement let me further add little more fact here present crisis has proved the fact that if the developing countries use their best of the brand and best of the product they develop and produce unless this is consumed unless it is sold and unless it is marketed in a countries like other where the market exists no profit can be made so their profitability will be impacted just after the covid you will see the result all the companies profits are depleting so in such a circumstances don't you think your far analysis should be converted into farm analysis marketplace should be given important for transfer pricing purposes though you are saying partly through the pillar 1 and pillar 2 but in real sense the analysis should be totally different look that's a good question and i think that um uh, what i what i would do is uh, i put a link in the presentation to the g20 paper that we prepared and i would encourage you all to 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 have a look at uh, that that paper but in particular there are a couple of important insights that are made in relation to developing countries and one of the things that we say in that paper is that we do think that um low income and low capacity countries could further benefit from new efforts at the international level uh to address the challenges that they face in taxing cross border activity and and offshore as assets and we think that there is an opportunity for a an even larger dialogue than we have been having in the context of the tax challenges arising from digitalization so even though we think that that work is important and will continue to be important and should be progressed uh as as we've said we also think that this is probably an opportunity a moment in time where we have to have an even broader discussion with developing uh, low income and low capacity countries about how we can ensure the international tax system is um delivering for them uh and that's something that we stand open and and ready to to have as we move forward so i think um it does present that opportunity uh, obviously that discussion will have to occur in a multilateral context uh but we um in our paper to the G20 uh openly canvass this idea and uh, uh there's a little bit more detail on that that I would uh, draw your attention to in the report uh, if it is a matter that you're interested in sir lastly one question more that you have said about giving stimulus for demand oriented you should generate the demand and target less uh, affluent household uh, people now question is how do you, what sort of a uh, stimulus you think in your mind for generating demand demand oriented stimulus for example retaining the workers paying them the salaries or wages so that they can consume those uh, uh, for their day to day needs is it that the thing which you are talking about Uh, look uh, a lot of the the effort to keep um workers in their jobs um has been focused on the emergency response phase because that's crucial during that period where government have taken you know very unique actions to close down parts of the economy it means that many viable sustainable businesses all of a sudden have just taken a a cash flow hit and if they start laying off workers then it's always harder to reconnect those workers with jobs rather than maintaining that connection through a short term crisis so so that's an important part of the the rationale behind support uh, to workers and businesses that employ them uh, in terms of the the stimulus measures this will depend a lot on the the tax architecture and the payments architecture within a country uh, but it may be that um at that point some investment incentives uh that are temporary might be useful to encourage businesses to bring forward investment it may be that some direct support to households is important to ensure that consumption continues to occur uh now that may take the form of direct cash payments where that's possible 
uh, it may take the form of, of other um, assistance that, that puts some extra cash in the pockets of, in particular, low-income households. And we say that because when you put more cash in the pockets of a high-income household, there is often a higher likelihood that they will save that money uh, rather than spend it. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to encourage consumption in order to keep the, the, the wheels of the economy moving. So there are a, a range of measures that could be put in place. Um, to be honest, the, the recovery or stimulus phase is something that is well known to governments because um, you know they've all had to con contend with economic downturns and they've all been able to draw upon the different tools in the policy kit in order to, to do that. Um, what is perhaps more unique have been the emergency responses required during the response phase, um, because it's very rare that governments are trying to keep the economy moving at a time that they're forcing a contraction in consumption in some parts of the economy. Uh, and what is going to be, uh, I think, more challenging for governments will be the long-term financing question, and that's largely because the scale of what will be involved will be much more significant than what we've had to deal with in many episodes in the past. Uh, so that's going to be an important conversation that we want to have and, and support uh, from all members of the inclusive framework as we move forward. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mayur, you want to put any question? Otherwise, I think we have completed the time and we have... No, I think, uh, yeah, I'm done. No problem. No questions from my side. So, Siddharth? Uh, just, I would like to just uh, thank uh, Mr. David uh, Bradbury uh, for the excellent exposition on the subject. And uh, thank you very much for taking all the pains and efforts. I request Siddharth to propose a very well deserved one of things. Thank you. My pleasure. No, it was indeed, indeed excellent presentation. Indeed. Siddharth. Yes, Siddharth. Uh, on behalf of Bombay Chartered Accountant Society, I thank David for spending his afternoon and uh, bringing global perspective on various policy issues which governments are trying to take and the recommendations from OECD, because that's one pool where you get to uh, see all the uh, developments which are happening at government level. Thank you for sharing with us and candidly answering questions posed by Mr. Oswal on uh, uh, developing country front and what are the uh, concerns from a developing country like India, uh, which we are looking at. And uh, we believe that, uh, you know, like pillar one and pillar two, we also, uh, or we may see a pillar zero before we go to pillar one and pillar two uh, because of this pandemic going forward. So thank you for all your deliberations and we look forward for your uh, uh, additional contribution to Bombay Chartered Accountant Society and uh, sharing these updates with us. Thank you once again. Thank you, Mr. Oswal, for a, a wonderful session with David and bringing out questions on behalf of all of us. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thanks. Thanks to OECD. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Pascal. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sirs. Thank, Thank you, you sirs. Uh, we'll be closing this session now. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you.